1999. Some of you are old enough to remember this. Events unfolded that day that seemed kind of surreal. Two F-15 jets were following a Learjet that had veered off course and lost contact with the air traffic controllers. When the F-15s got up near the plane, they noticed the windows were frosted over and there was no sign of life. It was a ghost flight, if you will. But what captured the nation's attention about this so much that was that one of the passengers on board was the reigning U.S. golf champion, Payne Stewart. The sad saga unfolded over a period of about four hours. Experts on the ground concluded that what had happened was that not long after takeoff, that when the autopilot had been engaged, the plane suffered a sudden decompression, a loss of oxygen. Everybody on the flight quickly lost consciousness and died soon after from the lack of oxygen. And when the plane finally landed, ran out of fuel, it crashed in the middle of nowhere in South Dakota. And of course, that tragic irony is that the plane itself was fully functional. Everything necessary for flight and landing was working properly. But nothing else mattered if oxygen was missing. No matter how great that plane looked, no matter how smooth that plane flew, no matter how functional it was, it didn't matter much if there was no oxygen. And I think there's a spiritual parallel to, for us as well. Nothing matters if the husband doesn't love his wife. Love to a wife is what oxygen is to those in that plane. Nothing else matters if love is missing. Today we learn what a man needs, what a wife can give her husband. So that love to a wife is what, is what respect or reverence is uh, to the husband. Nothing else matters if reverence is missing. So the need of a woman given to her by God is this committed love of her husband. And the need of a man given by God is for respect and reverence. So today we're looking at the ABCs of marriage and we come to that third one. We come to C and we find out that that is communicate submission and reverence to your husband. Uh, Ephesians chapter five and verse 21 says, being submissive to one another in the fear of God. So you notice there that everyone really is to practice submission. Everyone is to be submissive to one another in the fear of God. We all are to be submissive, of course, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, be submissive to your husbands as unto the Lord. And Ephesians 5.33 gives us both parts here for the husband and the wife. Husbands, uh, we let each of you love his wife as himself. And then the message to wife, let the wife see that she reverences or she respects her husband. So the focus of the wife is on submission and reverence. And I know that that word submission makes the hackles on the back of your neck rise. I can feel it here today. But I, I hope to make it appealing to you today and at least give you some understanding of why this command is in Scripture. So I'm not saying you just uh, you submit no matter what. There is some exceptions, of course. But I'm going to make it so that you can understand it today. I think it's been very misunderstood. I think most wives would say that it's hard for them to get their husbands to communicate. Kind of like this meme. Tell me, Chuck, what is love? The feel of recoil and the smell of gunpowder. <laughs> Now, I think there's probably some women here that would say amen to that as well. That's what love is to them. Nothing quite like the feel of recoil and the smell of gunpowder. About two weeks ago, we talked about the differences between men and women. We talked, first of all, about the beauty and the beast, how the, the, the man has a thick, thicker skull and uh, how the ladies might have more brittle bones. And we talked about the, the tortoise and the hare, how women usually live longer than men. 
I'll talk to you a little bit this morning about the computer and the radar. Now the woman is, is uh, the radar and the man is more like a computer because they process information differently. A, a sophisticated form of magnetic uh, um, MRI, that's the word I'm looking for. The MRI, imaging on live brains, shows women use both hemispheres to solve language problems, and men only use one. So ladies, I guess what you suspected that a man only uses half his mind is true. <laughs> Scientifically, they have proven this to be true, but let me be quick to add, that does not make you smarter. <laughs> but you know, there's two hemispheres in your brain, and the left hemisphere deals primarily with logic, reasoning, calculation, and so forth. The right hemisphere deals with feeling, emotion, sympathy, love, intuition. Now, men do usually use primarily the left side of the brain, while women use both sides of their brain, proven scientifically now. But we know from brain autopsy, autopsies that the mass of fibers connecting the brain's right and left hemispheres is larger in proportion to brain weight in women than men. And more information is being exchanged between the two hemispheres in women that could account for women's uh, usually, again, we're talking generalities, uh, better communication skills, verbal skills. It could even explain a woman's intuition. The female brain has emotional capabilities on both sides. A man is centered on the right. That plus a woman's greater connection between these hemispheres make it easier for her to express emotion, but may also mean that she is less able to separate emotion from reason. So there's a very real difference between the way men and women look at things, and you know it's the source of so many arguments in marriages. Men te tend to be more logical and analytical and factual in their thinking. That's not to say that a woman cannot be but at the same time that she is thinking logically and analytically and factually, she is mixing in emotion at the same time. So now women are more detail oriented. For example, she wants all the details because she's using both sides of her brain at the same time. So guys, you come home from work and she says, how was your day today? And you're gonna say, oh, it's fine, it was fine. It was a good day. She wants you to tell her all the elaborate details of your day. You know, what happened? Well, we had a meeting today. We revamped a program. Well, she wants to know who was there. What did you talk about? Did you go out to eat? Who went out to eat with you? And what did you have to eat? <laughs> you ask her what her day was like, and you're gonna get more information perhaps than you wanted. It's, it's just the way that they are. And she thinks, well, you're, you just don't want to talk to me. You're being evasive. You're shutting me out. And she could rather just go on and on and on and on. <laughs> Studies have shown that a man speaks an average of about 25,000 words a day. A woman speaks an average of uh, 30,000 words in a day. 25,000 to 30,000, so that's about 5,000 more. If your wife is, is a stay-at-home Mom, you come home, you've used your 25,000 words up. She hasn't even started on hers yet. <laughs> and so generally speaking, women are generally speaking. <laughs> but you see, the man's left brain, is it's like a computer. Her right side works like radar. She has a great reception disc, and she, she's sweeping it all in. Uh, she, she's just taking everything in. And they see things and they feel things. So women get details that men don't get. And the reason that she can tell you guys that that is a bad business deal and say things like, I just don't feel comfortable about that. I don't, I don't like that guy. I don't trust that guy. You say, why? What's wrong with him? So I don't know but something is off and she's, she's just gathering these little bits of information. There's just something about that. And here's the thing, she's usually right. 
I have learned that in my life, that when my wife has a caution, I need to listen to that caution. I learned it the hard way once. I'm not going to go into that story, but <laughs> maybe another time. So you women are usually right, like this sign to the restroom. Men to the left because women are always right. <laughs> but I had some women confess to me this week that that's not always true. So now how does she, she know all this? Well, we call it women's intuition. Well, women are different. God has made you one because God wants you to be able to think clearly together. It takes both of you to come up with the right decisions in life. Men think with the head. Often women think with the heart. Remember we said last week, it gives all new meaning to that proverb, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Have you ever watched women when they sit at a table and have lunch together, for example? They're, they're taking in all these conversations at the same time. They can be talking to somebody and still know what's going on at the other end of the table. They can pause this conversation, talk about this one, and then just come back and pick up this one like they never missed a beat. It's an incredible thing. I've got a pair of rabbit ears. I, I just can only focus on one conversation at a time. Which, it's just different. What's better? There's nothing better, but it's just, it's just different. In fact, this happened to me a couple weeks ago. I was actually having a conversation with a man and a woman at the same time. I was getting totally lost. I, I'd look at the man. They were both polite. They were waiting their turn to talk to me. The man would say something. He'd finish. I'd turn to the, to the woman there, and she'd talk to me. Finally, the man just turned around and left because he realized that I wasn't getting either of the conversations. <laughs> Have you ever noticed when a woman wants to go to the restroom? She says, I want to go to the restroom. Anybody want to go with me? <laughs> or she'll get up and, and somebody will say, I'll go with you. Now, what happened if a guy stood up and said, <laughs> I want to go to the restroom. Anybody want to go with me? <laughs> Duh, no. <laughs> Which is better, the computer or the radar? Neither. We're just, we're just different. And thank God for the difference. A woman is a code speaker. A man is a reporter. A woman uses language to express emotion. A man uses primarily facts. You know, she's like to dispense facts. Women share, I like to say, men report. And that's the difference between the way men and women talk. And we have to learn this. Because we have to learn... Not only, guys, what our wife is saying, but what she really means. And that's not always the same thing. And that's hard. If you sense, for example, that she seems nervous and tense and upset, and you come home and you say to her, honey, is something wrong? And she says, no, everything's fine. That means everything is wrong. <laughs> you got to listen. You don't say, oh, good, I thought something was wrong. <laughs> when she says, do I look all right? That means tell her she's beautiful. Don't listen to what she says. Listen to what she means. They speak in code. <laughs> Men report, women share. That's just the difference. Women want romance. This is the romance and the mechanic. And you just go and see the books that women read and the books that men read. And you, you understand how true this is. What kind of books do women read? What kind of magazines do women read? They read things like how to have intimacy in your marriage. Uh, how do you develop closeness with your husband? Harmony in marriage. And what are men reading? Popular mechanics? Yeah. <laughs> how to remodel your garage? How to be a champion bass fisherman? Women are just different than men. We have to understand that. We have to respect these differences. If you read the book of the Song of Solomon, you will see there that the woman is the romantic. What does the man do? What does Solomon do? He describes the woman's beauty. You know, ladies want romance. And they think that, well, if we can just light up some candles, play some soft music, I will get my husband in a ro very romantic mood. 
So she fixes this nice candlelight dinner. She has everything ready, sprays incense. What happens? The husband goes to sleep. You, you know, what the husband wants and desires is he is attracted to his wife's physical beauty. So here's a tip, guys, and I've learned this one too. So I'm, everything I share with you, I've learned the hard way. <laughs> we need to be more in tune with the romantic side of us. You know that romantic side we had before we got married? We need to get in touch with that again. And ladies, you need to understand that we are attracted to you uh, because of your beauty. It's not the candles, it's not really the atmosphere, it's really just you. So, submission and reverence, respect. I say all of that to say this, that allows you, wives, to have your needs of communication and romance met. These are powerful tools that you can use to influence your husband. Now, this word submit that we don't like so much, it simply means to line up under. This is not inferiority, but it's spirituality. Submission is the place or position of the wife in God's order for the home. It's not an inferior position, and it does not mean that she is inferior in any way to her husband. Simply and plainly, it is one equal voluntarily placing himself or herself under another equal that Jesus Christ would be glorified. Now, the devil would tell you that submission is a bad word. The devil will tell you that if you are submissive, you're inferior. But that is a lie from hell. Because here's what Philippians tells us. Philippians chapter 2 tells us, talking about Jesus, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being in, made in human likeness, and being found in appearance or fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. And the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. Because of the submissive spirit of Jesus Christ, willing to take the form of a servant, God exalted him to the very highest place. Jesus took the low way and God exalted him. The devil took the high way and God had to bring him down. And he's still going down. And someday he'll go down into the very deepest pit. So what I'm saying to you is this, you are never more like Jesus than when you have a submissive spirit. But again, it does not mean that you are inferior. Here's what the Bible teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, if God the Father is the head, and Christ the Son is under the headship of the Father, that does not mean, it does not mean that Jesus Christ is inferior to the Father God. God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, they are, co excuse me, they are co-equal, they are, co sorry, I had uh, some dental work done, uh, apologize, co-equal and co-eternal. And um, we would, it would be blasphemy to say that Jesus Christ was not equal to the Father. The triune God is equal one to another. What is the difference? The difference is in their roles. The difference is in, isn't that one is more superior than the other. Their roles are different. And Jesus Christ is in submission, though, to the eternal Father. He takes that position of servanthood voluntarily. We could say this, Christian submission is one equal voluntarily placing himself or herself under another equal that Jesus Christ might be glorified. Now the husband and wife, they are a team. I picked on Matt and Kathy because they like Packer games. They dress up. Let's take a football team. It's a good analogy of the relationship between the husband and the wife. A football team has a quarterback, right? The quarterback directs the team. That's the husband. Does that mean that the husband is superior to the wife? No, he's simply the quarterback of the team. And why is he the quarterback of the team? Because the coach says so. 
That's all. Because the coach says, you're the quarterback. But it's teamwork. Can the quarterback win the game by himself? Absolutely not. And it doesn't mean that he is more competent than his wife. There might be better athletes on the team than the quarterback. But that's the quarterback's position. And you know what? The other teammates, for a wide receiver, for example, might come up to the quarterback and say, you know, I can beat that guy that's covering me. Let's, let's run this route next time. And that quarterback has to take into account what his receiver is saying, what the coach is saying, and he has to make a decision on what to do. Now, the quarterback, like the husband, listens to his wife, takes in what she has to say, connects with God. What does God say about this? And he makes the decision. Somebody has to make the decision. God says the husband does that. But you know what, guys? You can delegate your authority, but you cannot delegate your responsibility. I can delegate my authority to my wife to do certain things, but ultimately I'm responsible for that. Do you know that the Lord Jesus Christ does not demand headship? He does not demand lordship. He doesn't force that on you. Like submission, we need to submit ourselves to him, to his lordship. And I would say this, ladies, submission is more for you than it is for your husband. You get the benefits of submission. Suppose a quarterback calls a good play and the team wins. They interview that quarterback after the game. Does he take all the glory? Does he take the credit? He says, no, I, I couldn't have won the game without my teammates. I couldn't, I couldn't have done. Didn't that guy make a fabulous catch? And he passes that praise on. But suppose that quarterback throws an interception at the end of the game. They're driving for the winning touchdown. He throws an interception. They lose. They interview that quarterback after the game. Does he blame his teammates? He says, no, that's on me. I made a bad throw. I made, I made a bad decision there. You see, and he takes the blame. And so being in submission, ladies, is really a safety net for you if you respect the headship of your husband. Submission allows you to be in the position where you are able to exercise the greatest power in effectiveness and influence. Because, ladies, I don't even know if you realize the tremendous influence that you have on your husband. And this is probably the greatest thing because, you know, there are two kinds of power. There is the power of authority, and there is the power of influence. Now listen to me. Often the power of influence is greater than the power of authority. This is why God put his people not in positions of authority, but in positions of influence. He had Joseph there in Egypt. Je Joseph was not the authority of the land. Pharaoh was. But Pharaoh was influenced by the wisdom of Joseph. You have Queen Esther. She is in a position, God put her there. God brought her into the kingdom at just the right time so she could save her people alive. She didn't have the authority to overrule the king's decree to kill all the Jews, but she did have influence. And her power of influence was great. Here's Daniel. You talk about Daniel. Daniel, over his lifetime, influenced as many as 13 kings and four different kingdoms. So which is greater, the authority or the influence? Often that influence is greater than the authority itself. The second thing a wife is commanded to do is to reverence her husband. Submission is the place or the position. Reverence is the practice or the activity of the wife in relation to her husband. It is her primarily uh, responsibility or duty that she has to fulfill. And this really gives, gives balance to this whole idea of submission. A wife who has a reverent spirit is able to say no to her husband when he asks her to do something that is wrong because she has gained, she has gained that, that privilege because of the way she's responded to her husband in the past. And I know it doesn't always work. And, th and this, this is the ideal thing. But this is, what the scriptures, this is what the scriptures teach. But a husband will know and react to a wife who may be submissive on the outside, but lacks a spirit of reverence for him on the inside. So reverence is the thing that makes a wife. 
successful. It makes you ladies successful as a wife. We said that, that uh, submission is more for you than it is for your husband. But reverence, on the other hand, is what a wife does for her husband. It is what she does to benefit her husband the most. And more than anything else, ladies, you got to understand this. As much as you crave love, your husband wants reverence and respect. That is what motivates him. It's not really love. It's not when you say, I love him, although that means a lot. But when you admire him and respect him for something, that is the ultimate for a man. It, it, is, it motivates him. It, it moves him. It uh, builds a husband. It'll lift your husband. It uh, challenges sometimes a husband. It, it empowers a husband. Reverence encourages a husband so that he is much more able to become what God wants him to be. So what is reverence? It's a deep admiration. It, it, it is approval. It is esteem. It is gratefulness. It is honor from the heart. It's devotion. It's adoration. It's respect. It's praise. It's almost everything, but of course it stops short of worship which is reserved for God alone. So ladies, if you give your husband genuine praise every day, I can promise you this, it will draw his heart to you. You think about this, one of the reasons God made man, it was because God, and God then God made woman, was because God knew the man needed to be reverenced. Now, certainly man is not made in God's image, but there is a comparison here. What is the worst thing that you could do to God? You could violate the first commandment. You could have other gods in your life. That's the first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Likewise, the worst thing a wife can do is to reverence any other man more than she does her husband. In fact, I would say this. The devil's substitute for the reverence of a wife for her husband is a strange woman's flattery. If you want to keep your husband from falling into the trap, of another woman flattering him, then you need to show him, you need to show him reverence. Your best protection for your husband's temptation to flattery is your reverence. In fact, reverence is so powerful that it can turn a man in, in all kinds of directions. And so ladies, if you give your husband genuine praise, it will draw his heart uh, to you. Reverence changes your husband and does something for the wife as well. Could we, we could say it this way, if the shining armor of your knight has rusted, try reverence. That's the way to change your husband. Now the Bible tells a story that shows just how much a man wants to be reverenced and respected. It's found in Esther chapter 1. It is so plain, it's almost humorous how much a man wants to be reverenced. In Esther chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is the Ahasuerus who reigned from India even into Ethiopia, over 107 and 20 provinces, 127 provinces. He had a huge kingdom. He also had unbelievable wealth and buildings and a throne room to show off. But here in chapter 1, he, he calls for his queen, he calls for... Um, Vashti to come and show off her beauty to the princes and people of the feast. And exactly what that means, nobody knows. But what we do know is she refused to come. Guys, you get this. He's got all these buildings. He's got all these subjects under him. But Vashti wouldn't come when he called her. Nothing else mattered to him at that point. He did not have the reverence he did not have the respect of his queen that he wanted. He wanted to show off her beauty. And here, suddenly all these buildings, all this wealth meant nothing. The one person that he wanted to give reverence to him refused to do it. He became angry. He called his wise men in and he asked them, what am I supposed to do about this? What do I do about my wife? And he said, you know, the women all over the kingdom are going to despise their husbands. They will take her example. Get this, we can't imagine a worse thing than that. So here's what they decided to do. They actually made a decree 
wrote a letter, sent it to all the women in the provinces signed by the king that women had to reverence their husbands. Is that kind of funny or what? But here's what it says there in Esther chapter 1 and verse 20. That when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all the vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Sigh of relief again. Important men, unimportant men, doesn't matter. Their wives are going to give them reverence again, give them honor. It's an incredible thing that a king would issue a royal decree and send it everywhere just to make sure that husbands are reverenced, that they are getting the respect that they deserve in their kingdom. Do you ever notice that when a man completes a job, he'll step back and admire it? He'll go away, he'll come back and admire it again. And he'll say to his wife, honey, what do you think of this? If you just say, oh, that's nice, and go away, you've blown it. You've blown a great opportunity. More than anything, a man wants his wife to say, that was a great job, honey. I'm proud of you. That's what he longs to hear. More important than the job itself, the work, is the admiration and the honor and the respect from his wife. Ladies, you reverence your husband. You build your house that way. A man's identity is so interwoven with the work that he does that to reverence his work is almost the same as reverencing him. In Genesis 2, God made a garden. Then he made Adam to dress it and keep it. And when God made Eve, there was something there, somebody there to say to Adam, wow, you sure are doing a good job with that garden. See, a man's fulfillment in life is not the work that he has done, but the wife who admires him for it and says, honey, great job. I love it. Let me give you an antidote. I'm almost done here. A wife is in the co-pilot seat of this airplane. Submission put her there. From this seat, she has access to the controls she needs to use. If she's in the pilot's seat, she probably won't have access to those controls that God meant for her to have. For example, she won't have the power of influence. So reverence is the activity of the wife. It's what she should be doing. It's the main task that she has to make sure that this plane, this home flies properly so that her husband, the pilot, and her co-pilot, the the passengers, the children, get to where they're supposed to go. Now, can this lady fly the plane from the pilot's seat? Yes, she could. She's got her credentials. But if she does she will probably fly it alone. She, she will think that her husband will just get in the co-pilot seat. They could just switch seats. She'll be the pilot, he'll be the co-pilot. But what is more likely to happen is that when she fulfill, takes that pilot seat and she looks over, her husband is not going to be in the co-pilot seat. He's going to be in the back with the children. I've seen it over and over again. He'd be one of the passengers, another one of the kids. You know, Ephesians chapter 5 and 1 Peter 3, it says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. The wives are told to submit before the husbands are told to love. And it's like God is saying something like this. Wives, you need to walk into the cabin of that plane, and you need to purposefully choose the co-pilot seat. That's what you need to do. And then you're going to say to your husband, Hey, honey, you take, you take the pilot seat. And, and I am I'm going, just going to love sitting in this seat right next to you as you sit in that seat. You are going to look so good sitting in that pilot's seat. And every once in a while, I'm just going to grab your hand. I'm going to tell you what a great job you are doing. Every once in a while, I'll just rub your shoulders, give you, give you a little back rub, and tell you what a great job you are doing flying this plane. Now, who's better? Who's the better of these two people? Who's the smarter of these two people? It could be either one, right? Often it is the co-pilot. But this has nothing to do with who is better or smarter of the two people. This, simply this, has to do with what the president of the airline has asked the two of you to do. And the president of the airline has asked the husband to sit in the pilot's seat and the wife, the co-pilot seat. That's it. 
That's it. That's really all submission is. There's a wife who said, you know, I can't praise my husband. I can't think of anything to praise my husband for. You know why? She was hung up on this one thing. She said, how can I respect a man who can't even hit the laundry basket? You know, all of his cl clothes just wind up on the floor. So here's what she decided she was going to do. She decided that she would try to think of some things that she could praise her husband for. His birthday was coming up. And she thought, you know, I, I don't even want to give him a birthday present. But then she was, reminding of, she was reminded of something that her husband did. And pretty soon she was reminded of something else her husband did. And then something else. And believe it or not, she came up with 365 ways to praise her husband. And what she did was she wrote them on a slip of paper, each one separately, and she put them in a praise jar. She marked the jar praise jar. She gave it to her husband for his birthday. Can you imagine that husband taking out one praise every day from his wife? It was the greatest birthday present he ever got. So our creator made the wife with a need, and he made the husband with a need. The wife's need given by the creator is for the security and commitment of a husband's love. And a husband needs the thing a wife's reverence provides for him. And the home is to be the mutual meeting of these needs. And then there is harmony. The husband singing in harmony with love and the wife singing in harmony with reverence. A husband should not seek his wife's reverence, but every wife ought to remember to give it. Husbands, when you sense a need for your wife's respect, let that remind you to demonstrate love to your wife. And wives, when you need to feel the security of your husband's love, let that serve as a reminder to reverence your husband. See, what we usually do is, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a book that is actually about this, and they say, they use the term crazy cycle. That you get on the crazy cycle. The husband doesn't love the wife because the wife doesn't respect the husband. And so they just get on this cycle and the husband says, well, I'm not going to show love to my wife when she doesn't respect me. And the wife says, well, I'm not going to respect my husband when he doesn't love me. You know what? Somebody, somebody get off the crazy cycle and just do what your spouse needs you to do. You can have a plane. You can have a beautiful house. It can all be fully functional. Everything that you need, everything necessary for flight is there. But if there is no oxygen, if there is no love and no respect, you're on a ghost flight, if you will. Can I have your heads bowed, your eyes closed? And as I said, a marriage really involves three people. Remember the triangle? It's a husband, wife, and God. So maybe you need to go to God today and say, Lord, I need, if you're a husband here, even though we talked about it last week, I need to show love to my wife. Unconditional, supporting love. Help me, Lord. Give me the grace to be able to do that. And maybe there's a wife here. You need to go to God today. And you say, I'm having a hard time, God, showing any respect to my husband. Would you show me some ways that I can respect him? And as you begin to meet each other's needs, according to the design of God, then your home can be built and blessed. So if there's anything you need to tell God, just take this moment to do so. Father, we come to you today. We need your help in these areas. These things don't come naturally to us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would put your love in our hearts us guys, for our wives, for our families. But I also pray, Lord, you would put that desire of submission 
just to line up under the desire in the women's heart toward their husbands. And Lord, as the second command for the husband was a negative one, to be not bitter against their wives, Lord, help us, none of us to be bitter. And as the second command to the wife for her husband is that she would show him reverence and respect. Bring to mind, Lord, things these wives can do to give honor to their husbands. Lord, this is not a thing of trying to grasp power and authority, but it's simply humbling ourselves, submitting ourselves to you, first of all, and then to other human relationships as we need to, so that you would be glorified. Father, I ask that you would be glorified in these marriages, that you would be glorified in this church because you are the head and we are all submissive to you. We line up under your headship today that you might be glorified in all things. For this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me give you some announcements. If you must leave, you can. We've been taking a